Thank you. You're welcome. How's everybody doing tonight? Everybody good? Very good. Okay, folks, I have seven o'clock, so I'm going to call to order the regular town board meeting of November 9th to order. It's meeting by, uh, by Zoom. I have a couple of announcements. Uh, first off, uh, public be heard, uh, as usual, at the end of the meeting, we will have uh, up to five slots, two minutes apiece for anyone um, who wishing to speak. And I think the, um, the chat is still in uh, on the side there. So if you want to speak, just send me a, a, a chat message and uh, I'll keep the list that way. Uh, the other thing, most of you probably already know by now, but the shady dumping case, which was supposed to take place last Thursday afternoon up in Shandaken, uh, was put off yet again. Um, my, to the best of my knowledge, um, the, one of the defendant's attorneys had a family issue, uh, so the judge acquiesced and uh, postponed it. And uh, to my knowledge, I have not heard any uh, rescheduling date. I know the last time uh, that happened. It took a couple of weeks for all the attorneys to be able to um, clear their schedules and get that um, back on track. So that's where we are with that. And another quick note, this Sunday, February, or excuse me, November 14th at 12 noon, uh, CSAC will be having a wood chip day. Uh, the town highway department is going to be delivering several loads of wood chips and, and placing the piles in a couple of different locations. And CSAC is looking for volunteers to help them uh, spread chips on the various um, trails to keep them safe and in uh, good shape for winter. So if you're around and wanna get a little exercise and, and help out on the Como, you can uh, contact CSAC at csac at woodstockny.org, O-R-G. So anybody interested in helping out, we could sure use a hand. Uh, the other one quick topic that I just wanted to touch on uh, with the board, and while we have WEC here as well, um, there's been a little bit of um, a growth in this movement where different towns in Ulster County have been passing uh, resolutions telling um, the UCRA that they do not want a landfill located in their uh, respective hometowns. I can tell you that uh, a list that was put together, and it's not really a serious list, but it, it really looked at um, uh, sizes of properties. A list was put together six or eight years ago by uh, UCRA, which listed uh, maybe 20, 25 different properties in Ulster County that might be feasible for um, a landfill. Three of those properties are in Woodstock. Uh, one is the chief's farm up on the top of Keefe Hollow Road. So every time that list is mentioned in the paper, I get a panicked call from him. The other is in the, Zena, the proposed uh, critical environmental area in Zena. So um, I uh, just put it out there that maybe at our next meeting, we, I could uh, cobble together a resolution letting the UCRA know that that Woodstock doesn't want a countywide dump in our town either. And I, I'm guessing that's the sentiment of probably everybody here, but, um, you know, weigh in in the next week and let me know um, if you feel differently. So with that, I will uh, turn the presentation over to the WEC for the Xena Woods Critical Environmental Area. Alex? Thank you, Bill. Um, hi, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name's Alex. Um, I'm the chair of the WEC. I'm just gonna do a super quick 
introduction and then I'm gonna hand it over to Gretchen to give us the presentation. So in 2020, the WEC spearheaded the completion of a natural resources inventory, which mapped and cataloged the natural resources and green infrastructure here in Woodstock and was to be used as a tool for the public and town boards to use when considering planning decisions. Um, so as a follow-up to that project and at the behest of the planning board, we've begun looking into designated um, designating critical environmental areas in the town. Um, we applied for and were one of two towns chosen for technical assistance guidance from Hudsonia and the DEC Hudson River Estuary Program in partnership with Cornell University, um, which was paid for with funding from the New York State Environmental Protection Fund. So we've had a working group. Um, it's consisted of members of the WAC, the Planning Board, the Town Board, and the Woodstock Land Conservancy. And this group has spent the past six months identifying a CEA for the town of Woodstock, um, which is going to be presented to everyone now by Gretchen Stevens. And Gretchen is a biologist with Hudsonia, which is an environmental research institute based in Dutchess County. Uh, she has studied the plants, animals, and habitats of the Hudson Valley for over 30 years and is the co-author of the 2012 study, um, The Significant Habitats in the Town of Woodstock. So Gretchen and the staff at the Hudson River Estuary Program of the DEC have been working with us here in Woodstock, the CE team, to identify, delineate, and describe the place that we're proposing uh, for the critical environmental area designation um, which is the Xena Woods area. So Gretchen, thank you for being here with us. Um, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I have a few slides I want to show you with some maps and other things, and I hope this will work. <clears throat> uh, Mm. Hmm. I'm sorry. I don't know why this isn't coming up. Hang on just a second. <clears throat> Do you see a slide by any chance right now? No. Bill, have okay. you given her permission to share? I Are thought you I had. Um... Uh, hang on a second. Oh, yeah, I had it. I had it there a second. How about there? There we go. Okay, good. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm just going to very briefly introduce um, the, uh, first of all, the concept of critical environmental areas for any of you uh, who are not familiar with them uh, and describe the Xena Woods CEA that is being proposed and some of the implications for land uses and other matters that uh, once and if the CEA is uh, eventually adopted by the town. The, uh, as probably many of you know, the New York state law does authorize municipalities to designate critical environmental areas to call attention to the places that deserve special consideration in the course of land use planning, in regulatory reviews of development projects, and in decisions about development and conservation and local legislation. A critical environmental area is defined in the law as a geographic area with exceptional character with respect to one or more of the following, a benefit or a threat to human health, a natural setting such as fish and wildlife habitat, such as open space or, or areas with a special scenic quality, uh, uh, areas of uh, with special agricultural or historic or recreational or educational values and other such values, uh, or an area with inherent ecological uh, or uh, geological or hydrological sensitivity that may be adversely affected by any change in, in land uses. How is a CEA established? Uh, 
it is established uh, after a public hearing and after a seeker review. Um, then uh, if the uh, municipal legislative body, such as the town board, uh, chooses to, they uh, will adopt the CEA and then register it with the state of New York. The purpose of a CEA is simply to, array, uh, to raise awareness about exceptional areas and ensure that the features of concern are considered in the course of environmental reviews, adoption of new legislation, or other actions that might affect the CEA. Once adopted, the CEA designation actually carries no actual land use restrictions. It simply requires the consideration of potential impacts uh, to the quality or status of the special features for which the CEA was designated. If the town board, for example, is adopting new legislation uh, that might adversely uh, affect or in any way affect the special features of the CEA, the board must then explain in writing how those effects were considered and how the decisions about the new legislation were made. If the planning board is reviewing a land development project within or adjacent to the CEA, they must explain in writing the features of concern uh, in the CEA and uh, how they might be affected by the planning board's decision. The CEA designation does not restrict what people can do on their land. It only requires that a decision-making agency pay special attention to the CEA features of concern. Uh, as Alex mentioned, the Town of Woodstock uh, Working Group included uh, members of the Town Board, the Planning Board, the Woodstock Environmental Commission, uh, and staff of the Woodstock Land Conservancy. They've been meeting through the summer and assessing different parts of the Woodstock landscape and are now proposing the establishment of the Zeno Woods Critical Environmental Area in the southeastern corner of the town. <laughs> it's the area shown in this slide in green hatching. Um, you know, red... uh, Gretchen, if, if yes. I could just interrupt for a second, you're, you're still on the first slide. No. At least on my screen, you are. Whoa, why does this happen? Oh, now, there you go. Now, now it changed. Yeah, there you go. Wow. You got your map so, up now. But, but you, sound, you sounded good though, Gretchen. I understood everything you said, even though we didn't okay. have it. <laughs> but you sounded good. Uh, okay. So tell me, I'm going to switch slides. Do you get an, something else now? A, Not yet. Uh, no. No. Still the map. Oh, gosh. I don't know why it's Yeah, not... we're looking at slide eight. We're looking at slide number eight on the screen. Wow. I'm sorry, I'm not sure we can solve this, but maybe, let's see if I get out of this view. Um, yeah, now you're looking at slide nine. Now slide 10, you went, you went to nine, then 10. Okay. Well, this is interesting. So if I don't do it in the uh, actual slideshow format, you seem to be able to see the, the changing slides. So I'll leave it here, even though it's not ideal. So this is the um, this map um, shows the the, the green uh, hatched areas over in the right over here um, are the proposed uh, that, that does uh, encompass the proposed CEA area. The red stippled areas on this slide are the land parcels with some kind of formal conservation status, such as the uh, parcels in the Bluestone Wild Forest and these areas around the, uh, the Woodstock, uh, the, rather the Kingston Reservoirs. The proposed CEA uh, encompasses uh, all the large forests that are east of John Joy Road and Zena Road. Um, it includes the, uh, the Bluestone Wild Forest as it occurs in, in Woodstock. These are the largest lowland forest areas in the town and are part of much larger uh, forest extending north, south, and east into the towns of Saugerties and Ulster and beyond. <clears throat> 
The CEA includes uh, a great variety of habitats, including upland forests and shrublands and meadows, forested swamps, at least 20 vernal pools, ponds, marshes, other wetlands, many small streams, and nearly a two mile segment of the Sawkill. There are many small streams and small wetlands. Um, the vernal pools are, uh, as probably most of you uh, know, these are small isolated wetlands that are the critical breeding habitat for a special group of amphibians that require these fish-free isolated wetlands that are embedded within forested habitats. The CEA includes an area that's been identified by the uh, New York Natural Heritage Program as important summer foraging habitat for bats. Uh, that's on this map, the, uh, this area shown with this kind of reddish arc through the, the, the southern part of the town and the, and the proposed CEA. A rare damselfly has also been found in the uh, Bluestone Wild Forest and could occur elsewhere in the CEA. The forests of the proposed CEA score among the region's top 10% in the Forest Condition Index developed by the DEC and the New York Natural Heritage Program. Uh, this is an index based on forest condition, connectivity with other uh, forest areas and other habitats, uh, habitat quality and other ecosystem values. In another analysis conducted by the Nature Conservancy, much of the forest in the proposed CEA ex and extending beyond the town boundary is ranked above average and far above average for climate resilience uh, based on geological and topographical complexity and the connectedness of habitats. The area proposed uh, for the Xena Woods CEA is also part of a large south to north habitat corridor through Ulster County that may serve as a conduit for plants and animals that are forced to shift northward to find cooler habitats as the, as the climate continues to warm. Although south to north corridors on protected land are widespread in the higher elevations uh, in Woodstock, um, protected lowland corridors are rare in the town uh, and in the region. So the CEA team believes that this corridor deserves special attention in considerations of land development and conservation. The forests of the Xena Woods CEA also help to protect the habitat quality and water quality of the Sawkill, which runs through the, the middle of the CEA uh, here. <clears throat> and it's classified as a trout stream uh, along this reach. In addition to their tremendous value for wildlife habitat, forests uh, in general are the most effective kind of land cover for maintaining clean and abundant groundwater and surface water. <clears throat> they promote the infiltration of precipitation and uh, into the soil. They reduce flooding they reduce soil erosion, they help to maintain cool temperatures in streams, they help to moderate local air temperatures, and they store large amounts of carbon in the vegetation and soils. <clears throat> they absorb air pollution and help to moderate uh, local air temperatures, a service that we will appreciate even more with the, the warming climate. Forests are also, of course, an important part of Woodstock's scenic landscapes. A large part of the uh, proposed CEA is underlain by an unconsolidated aquifer. Uh, this is an important source of drinking water uh, for this part of the town. The aquifer is the, the gray hatched area in the, this uh, area north of um, Sawkill Road. The CEA designation uh, is uh, in sum a uh, in recognition of the importance of this area for the ecological services to the human community, uh, the valuable habitats for wildlife and plants, uh, and support of local ecosystems. <clears throat> so that's um, much of what I wanted to uh, tell you about the proposed CEA. There are members of the CEA team 
uh, here tonight, and I'm sure that any of us would be very happy to answer any of your questions about the proposed CEA. I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing, but we can return to these maps if anyone wants to look look further. So I, I have a question, if I if I may. Um, this is Laura. Uh, so the question, well, first of all, I, I'm fully in favor of the CEA. I think it's an excellent piece of work, and thank you to everybody that worked on it, and, and I'm in full support of it. The question that I have is, besides being a uh, liaison to the WEC, I, I'm also active on the Housing Oversight Task Force. And so uh, as that task force looks for, say, where might you build, and then the, this proposed CEA is, where do you want to protect? If one wanted to build in the CEA, I know you're saying the planning board and different boards would consider the fact it's a CEA, but are there some basic do's and don'ts if you want to build in the CEA? What are the do's and what are the don'ts? Uh, yes, so this is, um, uh, these do's and don'ts would be particular to this CEA because of the particular features of concern mm -hmm. here. Um, there is a, um, uh, the CEA team has been putting together a uh, so-called justification document, which includes, um, uh, in addition to describing the CEA, it, it describes some of the threats to the features mm -hmm. of the CEA and, and has a list of recommendations um, uh, for the, the kinds of things that uh, would help to uh, protect the features of concern. In this case, you know, one one of the uh, general recommendations whenever you're dealing with large forested areas uh, is the notion of um, uh, uh, avoiding fragmenting the forest a, a, as much as possible. So mm -hmm. if you were proposing uh, a new uh, development, whether it's a single house or a, mm -hmm. or a, uh, a cluster of houses or a new subdivision, um, the um, the best way to preserve the uh, the features of the large forest would be to design the new development so that the feet the new features uh, are at the edge of the forest instead of mm. deep in the interior. Mm. There are lots of plants and animals that require the special conditions that you find in the deep forest interior. Um, so the more that you can maintain uh, the forest as a large contiguous block that is not split up by roads and driveways and yards mm -hmm. and so forth, uh, the more those features would be would be protected. Okay. Thank uh, you. You know, there are a number of other recommendations in there, say around um, protecting vicinities of, of the vernal pools, protecting their connectivity with other vernal mm -hmm. pools and with the forests that surround the pools. Um, and so forth. There, there are, you know, uh, a number of recommendations. Um, if the if the the CEA is adopted, these recommendations would travel with the CEA and would be there for the the town board and the the planning board to refer to uh, when they're uh, considering new new actions that might affect the CEA. Okay. And the other thing I'll say is we've been learning the term in this uh, housing oversight task force. Uh, the term conservation subdivision, is that a term you're familiar with? And, and that sounds like it would, it would align with this if we consider the conservation subdivision techniques would probably be helpful in the CEA. Yes, absolutely. Uh, a conservation subdivision would be the very thing to, uh, to do uh, in, uh, in, uh, for a new uh, kind of subdivision within the CEA. Mm -hmm. um, the, the whole idea would be to help protect you know, uh, significant habitat areas, um, and um, and it, and uh, keeping the the new developed features mm -hmm. sort of usually cl clustered somewhat, and um, and uh, yes. Cool. Thank you. I, 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 excellent piece of work, and thank you, Richard. Yeah, I think uh, without getting too much more detail on the uh, housing oversight committee, I think at best at some point, obviously. These committees have to have to speak to each other and and work together on this. Uh, we're kind of going on different tracks, not different tracks, but we're in same, the same direction, but we're not talking. So uh, down the road, this has to come together. I think that should be the next step, actually. Anybody else on the board? Questions? 
newly elected officials, any questions, comments, Maria Elena, Bennett? Uh, I certainly was just gonna uh, agree, I agree with Richard that um, connecting these committees and, and you know, so that they have a dialogue, uh, so everybody's on the same page because there's overlapping issues, um, I think is a great idea. So. Mm -hmm. Richard, who's the best contact for the housing committee? Well, either Kirk or uh, Deborah, Kirk go on. Student. Okay. So, yeah, I Alec, I don't know how quick they're going to be ready to do this because we're still in the midst of a lot of work. Right. Uh, and Laura, I see Laura's here. Judith is here. Uh, but but at some point, yeah. I, I what I, what I'll do tomorrow is just put an email out um, to Alex and Deborah, and maybe they can start a dialogue and about Kirk. Uh, okay, I'll include Kirk. Alex, anybody else I should include? Another point person from your? Um, I think, you know, we, we discuss pretty much everything uh, as a group. So you can get it to me and I can okay, get it to everyone else. I think it's important to just stress to everyone that, um, and I spoke to Maria Elena earlier today. We had a really good conversation about uh, this, actually. Um, that there is sort of like a dichotomy that gets set up often that environmental issues and protections are the enemy of housing, of development, of the economy. And it's sort of a fake, um, sort of this false dichotomy because you can have all of the things. This is just asking us to do it smartly. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to, you're not going to find a problem with the housing oversight committee. I don't think, I just think they need to communicate. That's all. Yeah. I just, I hate that it gets set up like, Oh, you want this. We want this. We all, I think we all want the exact same things and we want to make sure that we get to have all of them. You know, I, I, so we're, we're in to... I, I've been talking with, with, with both groups and I don't think th there's that yeah. much, uh, uh distance between either group. And I, I think a uh, conversation will, will bear that out. Yeah, yeah, we just need to figure out how to do it the, the right way and the smart way. I'm, I'm fully in support of the CEA. Uh, and one question that I'll have before we finish the whole discussion is what are our next steps to get going? Mm -hmm. You know, well, I think, I think that the uh, Housing Committee and the WEC should have conversation and, and, and let's get those two groups on board and then we can decide the next step. I, I you know, Alex, also I would say, I, I think, I, I don't believe there's gonna be much um, disagreement from the housing committee. I think my bigger concern and maybe Richard's bigger concern and others is that sometimes there's a perception in the public eye that, oh, this is gonna stop housing. And yeah. I think yeah. if we all stand together and say, no, no, that's, that's not what this is about. This is about doing it smartly not stopping it, um, I, I think that that would go a long way. So I think uh, putting those groups together and, and coming up with a united message would be very beneficial in moving this forward. Judith, did you have a question? Um, more, more a comment, being a, one of the people with Laura that's on both of these committees, the, the registration of the CEA with the state is advisory until and unless the town board chooses to make it part of zoning law in some way or other. Right. At which point, the question of how those kinds of concerns about it, environmental protection and housing come together would be in the in the board in the town board's hands. Correct. It would be zoning amendments, zoning changes, subdivision changes uh, that would all need public. Uh, public review, public input, and a public hearing. Bill, this this also requires a public hearing as well. So we yeah, are not- correct. Yeah. That I got. Yeah, okay. So I wanted to clarify, as, as you talk about how we want to get the housing and the WECCA talking, in particular, it's the Housing Oversight Task Force because the housing committee is a different group from the Housing Oversight Task Force. And my recommendation is you have the uh, WEC and Gretchen meeting, well, uh, Alex leading the way to meet with the Housing Oversight Task Force because mm -hmm. that's the group that's doing the mapping, et cetera. So, um, yeah, not the Housing Committee, but the Housing Oversight Task Force. Right. Okay. Max? Hi, everyone. Um, the other thing I would add is that 
you know, ha having this designation hopefully will inspire the professional community that it advises the many folks who want to pursue development in town um, to think, as you said, Bill, to the smart at design aspects of a, a subdivision or whatever. And there's so much information out there. And I think we want our professionals to do um, their best work in um, prizing the environment and, the, and all the natural resources that we you know, love and, and appreciate here in this town. And um, which I think is a, also, a, I think Alex has talked about this, a big attraction um, you know, economically for people to come here and, and see our beautiful town, et cetera. So I think, you know, let's keep those professionals in mind as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else have any other comments? Comments from the board? From WEC, Gretchen? Okay. So uh, Alex, expect an email tomorrow. And, um, and if you want to include me in the conversation as well, or um, I, I, I'm happy to participate, maybe four or five of us could sit down and, and start the dialogue. Um, and then we can plan the next steps. I guess the other thing in my mind is, I think it would be, while we, we wouldn't be adopt, adopting this right away, but maybe to, with the recommendations to really start to come up with some more concrete ideas of what exactly we're talking about uh, with regard to changes to the zoning law. Um, and um, I, I think that would be helpful for the public too. Uh, I see a hand up, Bill. Yeah. Bill, hi, it's Deborah Dewan here. You're, I don't see a picture of you, Deborah. How are I'm you? Sorry. <laughs> I just got home. Here oh, I am. there you are. <laughs> hi. Hi. Um, so I just, um, I'm really happy to see this presentation and appreciate all the work that's been done um, and echo what uh, Richard and Laura have said and what you said about uh, kind of uh, communicating. I just wanna say that um, even though the Housing Oversight Task Force, uh, our, our, our uh, charge is about housing, actually everything in our work has started with the environment. Mm -hmm. Everything we've been doing has been mapping the environment and mapping the constraints and the protected areas and all the resources in the environment first before we've even considered housing. And to Laura's point about conservation subdivisions, we're, we take this very seriously. So this is not, and I'm an environmentalist, so this is not an either or situation. And because we're all Woodstockers, um, I kind of see that we have a unique opportunity as a community who cares about both of these things to really be a model. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I'm excited about that. And whether it's the professionals or whatever, we're, we're, we want to encourage all of that to happen in our town. And uh, so I look forward to that conversation. Okay. So I'll connect everybody tomorrow and we can, we can start that. Thank you. Okay, any other questions before we move on? Thank you, Gretchen. Yeah, thank you, yes. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you to, to I know there are, there are a number of people that, that put this together. Alex, you were the lead on the WBC, so thank you very much. Um, it's great work. And you know, it really continues what Woodstock has been doing for decades. Um, I think we've been at the forefront. One of the reasons, for better or worse, that we're so popular and that people want to come here is because we've done such a great job at uh, uh, maintaining such a wonderful community environment. And uh, that's what draws people here. So uh, I hope to continue that. So, okay. If there are no more comments, then I will move on to some resolutions. Be it resolved to accept the resignation Resignation of Nick Fode from the Woodstock Environmental Commission, effective October 8th, 2021. Be it further resolved to thank Nick for his service. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Nick, thank you. I don't know if you're on tonight. I thought I saw, oh no, that was maybe Nick Henderson that I saw come on. Okay. Uh, be it resolved to authorize the town clerk to advertise the towns in the town's official newspaper openings on all volunteer boards including the W 
EC and uh, CSAC. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Be it resolved to authorize the supervisor to sign a contract with Law Enforcement Consulting of New York State, LLC. Rich, I know you had a question, so if you want a second uh, purpose. I'm sorry, I spaced out for a second. Repeat that. Be it resolved. I was so, I was so excited about the last vote that I just <laughs> About the advertising that for the yeah, volunteer yeah, boards? Yeah, it got, that, that got you excited, that, huh? that, that gets me every time. Yep. Okay. <laughs> you did resolve to authorize the supervisor to sign a contract with Law Enforcement <laughs> Consulting of New York State, LLC. And that's the uh, accreditation. Uh, I can't say anything until you second it for purpose of discussion. Okay. Second for discuss purpose of discussion. Yes. Sorry. So I'm, um, I'm still all rattled by the newspapers. Okay. Um, <laughs> I see that. That has to do with the accreditation, correct? Co correct. So, you know, a number of years ago, probably the first year I became supervisor, I know I talked to Clayton. I've always felt strongly about uh, the town <laughs> becoming accredited or at least heading in that direction. Councilman Earls read, led a, um, a wonderful committee uh, to take a look at our police department uh, over the last eight, 10 months back last winter. And I think one of the key points was that uh, accreditation was important and would really raise the level of uh, professionalism uh, within the department uh, and bring all, all departments within the state uh, on par with one another. Um, this is a bit of a daunting task and um, we've gotten a little bit stuck with this. Um, but we, the chief and I uh, recently met with uh, a gentleman, and actually I'm blanking on his name, Joe, but I don't have it here in front of me. I know it's on the contract, uh, who is a retired New York State uh, uh, police officer. He was responsible for uh, writing a lot of their policy. He actually is still uh, doing some subcontract work for the state police, as well as the state park police, which is basically the equivalent to the state police in helping them with their policy. Um, this contract is a pretty simple one. Uh, and actually the chief was, was a little concerned about it when we first met with this gentleman that he was going to come and offer a $20,000 contract to, to get us accredited. He is proposing a, a contract where he would work for $65 an hour um, and he would only um, provide services when we called. So basically the model that we would use is we would have uh, probably one or two, although others would be involved, but one or two point people within the department. Uh, and I think the chief has an, a couple of uh, individuals in mind, but I'm not sure on that, um, that would uh, start to, uh, I think there are 133 points where we need um, a different policy written up. And a lot of it's already been done, but some of it needs to be reworded, redone, uh, touched up. So they would go through this, look at what other departments, accredited departments have done, what the accreditation calls for and start to rewrite policy. When they get stuck is when they might call Joe in to either tweak what they have um, or, or help Put them on the right track. Uh, the town, we could also reach out to him as we go along to, to periodically just review the work that's been done since he has helped a couple of agencies get accredited. Um, without mentioning names, we do have one officer, part-time officer, who was um, helped another uh, agency that he worked for previously get accredited. We also have a, an officer who's a training officer in another department. So we've got a lot of talent here. And um, so this is actually a pretty inexpensive proposition. Um, we don't anticipate uh, that we would be spending a ton of money and it would be on a month by month basis. That answer your question, Richard? Well, a couple, no, at least a couple more. Okay. Um, overall cost, any idea what we're looking at here? No. But again, it would only be on a month-to-month -month basis. Well, yeah, but and still, we should know. Number two. Yeah. 
You know, yeah, I, I agree. There's no way to know. But let me let me just ask you yeah, a question. Right. Maybe Reggie can Reggie can jump in here. Has this got buy-in from our from the union and from the force? I mean, how are we working this with those guys? Is this a top-down thing? Are we uh, bringing the union in? How are we doing this? The union would be involved in some discussions. There there may be some policy. The the department, the management has the right um, to. Um, uh, set policy, you know, the chief and the town board. Uh, but certainly my, my guess is that there will be some discussion, for instance, uh, body cameras. Uh, I know that other departments, that's been something that's been negotiated. Uh, although I think at this point, uh, most officers feel that it's, it's important to have and a benefit to them. Um, so there seems to be less pushback at this point, but that may be something that would be negotiated. There, there may be a number of things that get negotiated. So yes, I'm just trying I to make sure this is a collaborative effort and not a top-down effort. Well, Even again, we the, 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 the union doesn't write policy, but there may be. No, some, I understand. I understand yeah. that, but but saying that uh, is one thing, but to, to get buy-in and, 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 and cooperation, uh, we bring people together. What? Yeah, and what I would point out is, again, it would be one or two of the, the, the rank and file that would probably be the point people on this. So, the, you know, there's certainly buy-in there. It's not going to be the chief writing this on his own in, a, in his room. So Yeah, I, I have some questions when it's my turn. Go ahead, Laura. Okay. Well, first of all, John Lugwood held, held the sign. There is no chat. So people can't put in a chat that they want to speak because there uh, there is no, I can't find the chat on my screen either. And John put up a sign saying no yeah, chat. I noticed just, that too. Yeah. yeah, so there is no chat, just so we know. Mm. Uh, but, but my question though is, I, I guess I'm still back to the point of we're authorizing you to sign a contract and you don't have any number at all. Mm. I know you're saying it's a month to month, whatever we use, we pay for, but... You know, we 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 were we were all in those budget me meetings, mm -hmm. and and Bill, you're very careful with every dollar, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of requests to say, hey, can you spend this or that? And anybody who wanted to spend money had to find out where's it going to come from. So, is this money going to be spent in 2021 or in 2022? Uh, it's conceivable that it's unlikely, but it's conceivable that he could put a couple hours in between now and the end of the year. What the, the process will be that every month, just like our labor relations expert or our attorneys, there'll be a voucher submitted with his time. I mean, when we hire attorneys, when we hire attorneys, we sign a, a contract with them and we don't, we don't get a set fee. So, um, so is so this coming in, out? I know you put, we, we have- 40, In the police 000. budget. It's in the police oh, budget. Oh, the police budget. So it's yeah. not in the $40,000 professional budget and includes no. attorneys. There's, it's there's in the police- it's in the police budget and you believe there's room. And if there's not room, we can put on the brakes. If it turns out we're spending too much money, we can put on the brakes and not continue. Absolutely. And it, again, it's a month to month uh, endeavor. The contract can, can, if you read it, you'll see that it can be um, uh, ended at any point with no penalty. Uh, and, and it's, again, he's a consultant that only consults when he's asked. Yeah. Right. So he's not doing, you know, the bulk of this work. No. Someone to really check in and consult with I, as we move I, through the process, through the absolutely, staff. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll tell you that the chief's um, number one um, reluctance to even have the meeting was he didn't want to get saddled with some ten or $20,000 contract to, to produce this. He's very happy and content with this and is eager to move forward with it. Um, he also, and I agree with him, we also feel that there may be other areas where he could actually assist us. For instance, uh, during that meeting, uh, Sergeant Van der was there, and there was also another retired uh, state trooper, uh, Bob Nuzo, who's a, a resident in town. And there was a conversation about evidence and, and you know, what, how much evidence we needed to keep. Nothing to do with accreditation, but they offered some good advice to us in, in different things we can look at to reduce the costs of, of maintaining and keeping evidence. So there may be even other areas where he may be able to come in and consult periodically with us. 
that's so, yeah, the type but... of that's the type of input I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Very frankly, you know, just yeah. that co collaboration. Reggie, does this coincide? How it works out with your police report? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of the major takeaways right. from the work that we did. We wanted to move towards accreditation along with other things, but this was a huge uh, okay. piece of it. It was an important piece of it, I should say. So the question I was going to ask is, who is the biggest driver of this? Is it that report, Reggie, you're talking about, or is it the police chief saying, hey, we really could use this? So just out of curiosity, who would you say is, what, what is the greatest driving force for us to say yes to this? The, this report Reggie had or the police chief or somebody else? Are you asking me or Reggie? Anybody. Well, you know, I can tell you again, I, five years ago when, when early on as supervisor, I viewed it as critical that at some point the town moved towards getting our department accredited. <laughs> Insurance reasons, liability reasons. Um, I think that the former governor had a plan. I mean, I, I believe that that whole um, uh, committee that he for, put on every town to review their police departments, I really think the end goal on his part was to either see small departments fold or get them accredited. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I, I do believe there's a real, real value for the public, for us as, a, as mm -hmm. managers and for the department um, at, as, uh, in getting accreditation. Agree. Reggie, I don't... You, agree, I agree. And, and register. And I know the chief, I mean, it's been, you know, has wanted to do it also. So um, I didn't go out and find uh, his, his last name is King, Joe, um, Bill. Thank you, Joe. You're King. welcome. Um, but it, again, it is a piece of um, one of the tasks that came out of that, the work that we did over the, over the winter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, I'm, I'm satisfied. I, I think it sounds but I, I agree with it. I, I appreciate the conversation. You know, I, if it if it makes you guys feel any better, I mean, you know that I, I do not like spending money. Um, you <laughs> yeah, know, I, yeah, we yeah. can have an a, a informal agreement where I'll just monitor on a month to month basis. And if the bill starts to get anywhere south of 700 bucks, a thousand bucks, whatever number you're comfortable with, you know, I'll, I'll slow it down for that month. And then we can all you know, during vouchers, take a look at it and, ha and have another conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it would benefit us, you know, periodically that we could have whoever ends up on our end writing this, you know, every two or three months get a report or, or maybe, even, maybe even every month get a report of, you know, where were we at? They've got a hundred and 133 standards, I think, that they need to meet to get accreditation. So, you know, it's a checklist and it would be easy for them to come on and spend 10 minutes and, you know, say, okay, you know, here's where we're at this month. We've, we've checked off 35 of them. We we've hit, uh, you know, 20 of them were very easy. We've hit five that were difficult and we used uh, Joe for, for this and that and the other thing. And, you know, so it's something that we, we could stay on top of very easily on a month to month basis. And Bill, I, we didn't have a chance. We talked about this last week, um, last Thursday. I haven't had a chance to talk to the chief or to reach out to Joe Keen mm -hmm. yet. But I think it would be good for us to get some kind of timeline, just a rough idea like of this, a map of what the goals are for how we're going to move through the process. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that uh, what Joe, that did come up a little bit. And you should talk with Joe as well. And actually, Reggie, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be the point person on this. Yeah. But uh, you know, Joe, his answer back was as quick as you guys move and, right. and he's talking to the town. Right. So, so I think it'll be important to sit down with the chief, too, and get just get a real map of uh, how we're going to move through this and what, what the timeline is. So, or we're clear so maybe, kind of maybe later this goal. week, li later this week or early next week, we could we could sit down with the chief and. Um, yeah. Actually, you know, I, I am at the end of the meeting. I added, I'm going to have a, a meeting next week to interview uh, police officers for a temporary position uh, at five o'clock on Tuesday. So that would be a time when we could all sit down yeah. with Clayton and, and have a conversation about this as well. Sounds good. Tuesday okay. works for me. Okay. Any other questions about this? Nope. All in favor? Oh, sorry, Richard. Aye. 
No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, okay. Richard, I know you had a question about this one too. So be it resolved to authorize the supervisor to sign change work order number one for Mink Hollow Road Bridge Replacement Contract TW-200 with Kingston Equipment Rental Inc. Net sum of this change work order is 15,000 plus 15,000. $792, new contract sum, including this change work order, is $1,127,792. Second for- My only question was, uh, who's paying for it? Okay, Just give me a second for purpose of discussion. I'll second it for- purpose Second for purpose of discussion. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, the, uh, the New York City is paying for it. So this, they, the city requested some more, I believe it's rip wrap and big stone for bank protection. Um, and it does benefit us because it's, it's upstream of the bridge, uh, but they wanted some more stone put in there and they're paying the whole uh, nut for this. Doesn't cost us a dime. So anyone else have any other questions? We're all good. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we have one or two more. Be it resolved to schedule a special meeting for the town board via Zoom. Uh, although I will be meeting with the applicants uh, here in my office uh, via Zoom for Tuesday, November 16th, 2021 at 5 p.m. for the purpose of interviewing police officers. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so I'll be doing Zoom. I'll be here. Anybody that wants to join me, it will be an executive session. So, um, you know, the public is welcome to come for the first minute before we go in. Uh, and I, we, I don't anticipate that we would be making an actual hire until the following week. Be it resolved to hire Anthony Marciano as grade three part-time laborer for the water sewer department at a rate of 2187 effective October 10th. 2021. If I could have a, a second for purpose of discussion, I'll just explain I'll this. It for purposes of discussion. Okay, so Anthony, if you recall, was working for us. He did uh, resign a, a month or so ago. Um, there was some confusion between Larry and I. There was we had talked about him coming back part time to work weekends, and then it sounded like that wasn't going to happen. But I guess it has, and uh, everybody is down there is happy with that. So we just have to make it official. Any questions? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Bill, quick question. Fred. Yep. Did you mean that when you said we wouldn't make a decision on hiring until next week, did you mean next month? No, so Reggie, if you recall, uh, November, we're, we're doing our business meeting on- um, uh, It's two, November, two weeks from tonight. The 23rd. I didn't recall, but okay, I recall, but now I do, okay. Yes, okay, so we, we'll, we will have a public meeting, uh, a full meeting on the 23rd to pay the bills and whatnot, and if we do decide to make any hires, we'll do it then. I, I, what time I just, is that? So the, the executive session, the interviews, and, and you and Bennett are both invited to those, uh, will be at five o'clock on Tuesday next Tuesday, and then the business meeting is at the tip of regular time, seven o'clock. Seven o'clock, is that on Zoom as well? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody, uh, I know I we don't have the chat there, so I didn't get any list of people who wanted to speak public be heard. Is there anybody who wanted to take two minutes to chat with us about Well, Are they able to come off mute by themselves or do we have to let them come off mute? Well, I think they can come with news by themselves. If there's anybody. Anybody? But anybody, if, if you want to speak, raise your hands and we'll. Might want to mention, Bill, too, the new technology that might be coming. Richard, why don't you do that? Thank you. You've been very. Well, I won't be here. I won't be here when it comes. So. Okay. So Richard and I have been working um, for the last month or so. I, I anticipate, I think Richard agrees that. Uh, come January, the middle of January, we're supposed to go back to full public meetings. 
I don't know what, what's going to happen. It may happen. It may not happen. But I think that uh, some Zoom capability for every meeting is incredible. I think being able to let the public zoom in from home and, and watch us do our business, even if we're all sitting at a table, is beneficial. So to that end, um, we're going to uh, reconfigure how we tape our meetings. And this will also go uh, for the planning board, the zoning board, the other boards as well. So uh, what Richard and I have looked at and PCA has been great and Pam Boyle has, has been great in, in trying to put this together is we're looking at getting a new um, uh, camera that we would place somewhere at the back of the room and, and aim down at the, the uh, table. Uh, I think we'll probably have the ability to do remote control so that Tom still could come and you know, work the control on that camera to, to direct it to the person that's speaking. Um, but even for the other meetings, that it'll be a great pan of the entire room, so it'll really pick things up. We're looking at getting uh, at least four high-end mics so that there'd be three at the table and a fourth for the member of the public to speak. Uh, we'll get a new DVR player to both tape the, the uh, meeting for the town board so that it can go out, uh, be replayed on the, the television studio. It would also run through the DVD to the television station to go out live on Tuesdays as we used to do. Um, and we'll also, along with that, there'll be a computer so that we would still be on Zoom uh, so that on the big screen, you'd see the town board sitting there and then you'd see any members of the public that wanted to participate would be there. Um, did I miss anything, Richard? No, basically it's an integrated hybrid system which will allow us to go live like we normally used to do with a much better audio, I hope. And at the same time, incorporate Zoom for people who can't make it. Mm -hmm. And especially during winter months and things like that, it's important. Thank you, COVID. Jude has given us a thumbs up. Thank you, Jude. Thank you, Jude. Oh, thank you, Terry. <laughs> so, and the best part is it's not going to cost the Woodstock taxpayer anything because we can use um, American Rescue Plan funds for this to improve our communication. So that's what Richard and I are working on. Um, and probably in the next month or so, we'll be able to bring the whole package to the board and see if you want to spend the money or not. Yeah, sounds excellent. So, so Lauren and I could do publicly heard from home once we go off the board, right? <laughs> as long as I still can hit the mute button, sure. Oh, no, we're, we're taking that out of play. <laughs> yeah. I can't even find it, to be honest with you, Lauren. <laughs> I got so much stuff on this screen. I'm, I'm not sure what I'm looking at. So, we got yeah. four minutes between us to make your lives miserable. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. All right. With Surprise, that, I see a hand up. Where's the hand? Uh, James Frain. James. Hi. Hi. How are you? Very good, thank you. Uh, should I just get right into my proposal? Get right, in, get right into it. I'll start the clock. <laughs> okay. Uh, I live with my wife, Donna Cole, at 70 Sickler Road, just to place it in context. We have a, about a six acre property. We're lucky enough to live in a beautiful place. Um, in the past five years, I don't think it's uh, anybody listening knows how much more activity there is. And along with a lot more activity up here, there's a lot more noise. And my pet peeve, first and foremost, is leaf blowers. Um, <laughs> Bravo. It used to be even a few years ago. Uh, maybe you might have an hour or so a day uh, of leaf blowing. Um, for the past couple of years, it's been more like uh, every day, all day, there is machine noise in regard to lawn care, but the primary and loudest noise all day, every day from April to through October is leaf blowing. 
And a lot of the crews, I'm sure you've seen it. It can be as absurd as maybe the 300 square feet of lawn in the uh, Lake Hill post office. A crew arrives with two leaf blower uh, backpacks and uh, an incredible amount of noise. And in the past year or two, um, it's overwhelming. Now, I started to read about leaf blowers and uh, bans on leaf blowing around the country. There are over, well over 100 communities around the country, most of them in California and New York that have leaf bans, leaf blower bans. They vary in degree uh, from uh, the amount of months of the year you can have leaf blowing, for instance, from a lot of them are from May through September, banning leaf blowing outright of any kind. Some of them are gas powered leaf blowers, which are much louder than electric. What I'm proposing is a ban on gas powered leaf blowers at any time. And when I read about the noise and with nonoise.org, for instance, I, I then learned that there are other harmful qualities that maybe are even greater than the noise, though not for me, but emissions from two stroke engines are a considerable contributor to carbon emissions. In California, they now account there are more emissions from uh, lawn two-stroke engines and four-stroke engines, but lawn um, equipment than there is for automobiles, which is why the state of California is going to ban the sale of all gas-powered lawn equipment starting in 2024. Uh, the... I'm going to ask you to wrap up. We're hitting three. Okay. The other considerable harm that it causes is debris, debris blown into the air. And the debris is a combination of animal feces, chemicals, fertilizers, and just particulate matter. And, it, and it's considerable. And the thing that troubles me the most is the, the effects the positive effects of leaf blowing are very temporary, sometimes as long as an hour. And then the wind picks up and it's dispersed all over again. Um, and the last thing is there are alternatives to leaf blowing. You don't have to do it at all. So I would just um, remind the board, uh, James was kind enough to send us a number of emails with information. I forwarded that all to you. Uh, you should have his email in the forwarded one. So if you want to uh, discuss this any, at any great length with him, feel free to reach out. And we, I'm in favor as long as you throw in backup alarms. <laughs> I agree with you. My house, well, all I hear all day long is backup alarms and leaf blowers, wood chippers. It just, it's not the same world I grew up in, that's for sure. And, and, you know, I'm not even kidding. The backup alarms, we had one neighbor, they're a good 600 yards away. We had backup beepers going all day, every day for two weeks. It really gets on your nerves. It really does, yeah. I use Do we, bad language to a man one day. If you can believe There are that. also, you know, I don't know the difference between two-stroke engines and battery-operated leaf blowers, but I know battery-operated leaf blowers are out there. Um, I don't know if they're as effective or as powerful enough, but you're right, James. Uh, the, the, the result of leaf blowing is very temporary. The wind blows or it rains five minutes later, and it, it, it does, you know, what's the point here? Uh, I mean, I don't know how you go about, I read the article in the New York Times, um, and I don't know how you go about doing a local regulation uh, I would assume, Billy, then we have to get back to decibel readings, but uh, um, yeah. that's all That's all stuff we need to look at. Okay. Okay. All right. James, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hearing me out.
So I am going to move to go into executive session for the purpose of um, uh, uh, discussing contract negotiations. Yeah, before we do that, I, I wanted to, um, you know, make, make, a, make a, a statement if I could um, before we go into executive session because everybody kind of drops off at that point. Um, I want to just take a minute. I wanted to thank our planning board. As a lot of people know, um, well, and, and as people know, I'm also uh, chair of the zoning revision committee, and we've had discussions about the scenic overlay. And the planning board has had a big, a difficult case with the scenic overlay. And I just want to give my thank you to the planning board. Um, it, it's it, it's a little tricky in terms of how we, uh, as a town, how do we? You know, we have a scenic overlay law, a zoning law. But then it can be tricky to enforce that law or tricky to, uh, you know, make sure that applicants adhere to it. And so the planning board did really, I think, stick their necks out. It takes some courage and, uh, and caring, uh, courage to say no to an applicant because the applicant did do a lot of things right, but they also did some things not right. And it takes some courage to stand up and say, hey, we need to deny you because there were some things that weren't done right. And we do want to protect the scenic overlay. We do want to protect the viewscape for all of Woodstockers. And uh, I think it was a big deal, the action that the planning board took. And I want to thank you, thank, thank them for that action. I, I know I, I had spoken to say, hey, I think there's a problem here. Bennett spoke and said, hey, I think there's a problem here. And it does take courage and also caring. Um, it's easier to, to roll over for the applicant than it is to stand up and say, hey, you do need to make some changes before we can approve this. And, and I want to thank the planning board for that. I also want to say uh, the planning board recognizes that there are some bigger issues looming in terms of what's being done in the scenic overlay. And I want to thank the planning board for actually scheduling their December 16th planning board meeting, which will start at 630, is going to be fully devoted to scenic overlay discussions. And so, um, you know, I'm on the zoning revision committee. You know, a lot of different committees are invited to come. Of course, it's a public meeting, but I just want to let people know that there is going to be a big focus by the planning board on scenic overlay in the December 16th meeting. It'll be kind of a work session to talk about what are the issues with the current law, what are the issues with adhering to the law. Maybe things are mushy. Maybe they should be cleaned up. Maybe there's process situations. But anyway, the December, I thank the planning board for scheduling the December 16th meeting to do a deep dive in the scenic overlay because I think it's very important we protect it. And I just wanted to thank the planning board for those two actions. My motion is still on the table. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Uh, we Aye. have a hand up from James Frain again. Um, it was never taken down. Sorry, I didn't take it, it was off. never taken yeah. down. Never mind. Okay. Sorry. So I'm in, I'm in favor. Uh, okay. All in favor. So uh, folks, have a good evening. Um, Bennett and Maria Elena, you, you should stay on.